Good afternoon. Um, it is uh, indeed, Julie was saying to me earlier how serious a group this is. And I spoke before uh, two, two or three OLLI groups four years ago, and, and I do appreciate this. And I, and I uh, am touched to be between Mark Petraka and Gil Gonzalez, really the representations <laughs> of, you know, the highest work you can do in, in our field. So I hope to rise to that today. Um, thank you, uh, Julia and Jenny, for uh, setting this up. Uh, Dave Tomchuk, who's not here, and his crew um, have been uh, helpful in lots of ways over the years. My friends Molly McGuire, Carol Gardner at the front table from my uh, academic senate days, and when my daughter was probably six months old. Um, my colleague Sharis Kubrin, uh, who with me, we're going to talk uh, next month to a, a smaller group about similar issues. Uh, I'm thrilled to have my chair, Carol Cerrone, my dean, Val Jenis, who are the president of the Pacific Sociological Association, the president of the Law and Society Association, the former president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and so forth. We have a very good program here, and I'm happy to be in it. I couldn't get my job today. I couldn't buy my house today. <laughs> my wife, I think I could still. <laughs> And uh, Patricia DeVoe from our development office is here, and she's going to tell me later what parts she likes and doesn't like. And I'm especially, um, because I'll have to give a shorter version, what part she likes, I guess. Um, uh, especially Tony Dwyer, who f four years ago uh, set me up the Friday before the Obama-McCain election and the Friday afterwards, and then later on in this room. So we were over in Woodbridge the first two times. And they were instrumental in work I've been doing. And as I think of it, it was work that will be contained in this, uh, this work in this time period. The, uh, the book that I'm finishing is called Until the Editor Takes Her Shot at a Fancier Title, Working Title, uh, After the Culture War. Birthers, tenthers, deathers, and tea parties in the Obama era. And we'll talk a little bit more about who all those different people are. But in November of, uh, of this year, I was uh, a partisan, but also an academic. And at that point, the work that I was doing either was going to be about a truncated four-year period, or I won't see the end of eight years. And I can't talk about it being 12 years. The Reagan era, you could say, was those 12 years, and then afterward. Um, but we live in the Obama era, and so uh, he is there. Uh, this is the title that the editor said she was going to change six years ago, and never did. Sin no more. It was the previous work that I talked a lot about in uh, 2008, where Dan Hillier and I, former graduate student here, professor at Southern Illinois, we sought to kind of uh, blow up a, a common perception that America ha was taking a conservative turn. Val and I had a, a very fruitful discussion about this in an airplane on the way to or from Nashville where we were at our uh, criminology meetings. And it just seemed wrong in 2004 to depict America that way. This was the culmination of that. And we focused on the elements of... Uh, they're dancing. Um, we argued that the tide was turning actually in a, the America at that time. On these particular issues, we were interested in what we call victimless crimes, personal morality issues, abortion, um, gay rights, uh, stem cell research, uh, euthanasia, uh, and gambling, which was the most normalized at that time. And so at that time, we challenged the, the election as being uh, showing the social conservative America. So it'd be easy for me to say, wait. Let's use elections as the only arbiter of how our country changes. Forget about talking to people in focus groups and polls and watching change over time. Electoral politics tells us what we need to know. So in a sense, it's kind of a cheaper version. And I hate to pick on Karl Rove because he's got a lot of money, but he will show up again later because he set out to make 2012 a different uh, uh, endpoint than it ended up. One of the beauties of talking at Ollie is that I can speak with some sense of people with shared experiences as I. And so the 20 year olds, I could tell them that Millard Fillmore started this and they would write that down. Uh, 
and he might have, but um, in, in recent times, and I, I show my age, I'm 60, I, I don't know the FDR period, I, I'm not that well read, I don't know how the pushback was, certainly it was big on him during his terms. But it, in my time, the Nixon uh, ethos was about enemies, and uh, start, uh, drawing stark divisions. And he, in his 1969 speech, talked about reaching out to the, the normal majority, the silent majority. And he sent his vice president out there. And I promise you no 20-year-old knows this man. I promise you. He sent Spyro T. Agnew out there. Um, wonderful. Bill Sapphire wrote the words, time for a positive polarization, which echoes now in the 2013, 2012, 2010, whatever period, because this was kind of the, the way it was said, that, that this was a way to advance a point of view, and this was, if not natural, this was uh, something that was. Nattering Nabob's negativism was, for those of you who remember the great, uh, and then ending up with Pat Buchanan, who had worked for Nixon, and later for Reagan, but the great moment for Pat Buchanan, and you can't find it on YouTube. You can find cats, you can find people with one leg juggling, you can find all that. I can't find Pat Buchanan, but his words are there. A religious war going on for the soul of America, a cultural war critical to the kind of nation we want to be. Bill Clinton was elected that year, and one of the issues was five years after Jerry Falwell had started the moral majority, had social conservatives really scared people off and scared moderates off. Um, so to set the baseline for where we are, and this is where we were, Tony, four years ago. Um, this is the 08 electoral victory, which I'll use as chapter one in the book to kind of uh, set up the baseline of the exuberance people had over the changes that were coming to American society. Um, if we looked at the 2012 map, you'll notice that later that he held on to all but two of the, the formerly Republican red states that he had taken. I think he lost back Indiana and uh, North Carolina. But a couple people, I'm going to put the great uh, social scientist Alan Wolf up here, followed by Peter Beinart, a uh, writer, um, were euphoric, I guess is a word. And so trying to catch the moment in 2008, right after the election, people said, this is a real transformative moment. You'll see the word thrown out that everybody uses, Carl Rovin included, that it's a realigning moment. Um, and the idea, I especially like one here, is that Alan, who's a, who I use a lot, uh, reading very uh, uh, erudite, well-read, well-reaching, managed to, somewhere in here, said that he had ended the culture war. And so that theme kind of dominated. Uh, Peter Beinart talked, again, 2008, that this was the possibility uh, for that president. Um, and so the question raised, and this is an old slide from talks given around that time, was after Karl Rove had stated in 2004 that a realignment had taken place and that the Republican conservative, we lived in a center-right country and we would have 40 years of dominance <laughs> within two years, and then within four years, not so. So now comes these people saying, boy, this looks like a big change. In 2012, I'm not going to make a... That, that kind of statement, but this is the thing you're always bouncing. Is it realigning? Is it derealigning? Is it, these are not words spell check likes. Re-realigning. Um, and so, the, the story then today is, is of the, the, the different kind of uh, paths, the collision courses, epitomized in the case of birthers, uh, people who, who doubt that uh, Barack Obama was born in Hawaii. Uh, deathers, people like Sarah Palin who thought that the uh, Patient Protection Act and Affordable, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which I will call Obamacare because it's so much easier and he finally said, let's call it that, um, will end up in people being shunted off to, to, to die quickly. Tenthers are people who believe in the Tenth Amendment, all rights not given to the federal government uh, devolved to the states. Rick Perry, big time on that. Um, and so the, the pushback, as Val will tell you, in all these fields, you know, if there's an advance, there's a backlash. It's a, almost a physical rule of this. Um, you know, I could have a hundred of the, I listened to Limbaugh on the way up. Um, 
I usually get about 15 minutes of it on the way to school. Um, in their best light, the tea parties, birthers, tenthers, deathers, tea partiers, a movement, people trying to figure out the great Theta Scotch Bowl back at Harvard, uh, people trying to figure out are they more Christianists, as Andrew Sullivan says, are they, they really the old um, moral majority Christian coalition dressed up in funny hats, as Sullivan says. Rick Perlstein, the historian, says there's always been a group that's pushed back against modernity. Um, but this was clearly a big phenomenon from April 15th, 09 and forward. And when I signed a, a contract for this, if I had said, I'm going to write a book on the Tea Party, they'd probably want it. But, you know, I wouldn't want to be writing that in 2013. Um, boy, there was, you could fill a bookshelf with all the books when they were first coming out as a phenomenon. Maybe it's too soon to know what it all means, but um, it was certainly an anti-Obama moment. We'll see that in a little bit. It certainly had to do with taxation. See a little bit. And I like nice, concise phrases. Election night 2010, the takeover of the, the House of Representatives by the Republicans, the seeming pushback on the Obama victory, Senator Rand Paul, we've come to take our government back. The Ronald Reagan quote, uh, you know, the scariest words that I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Um, <laughs> progress backlash. And we'll look at that in the eyes of what went on in, in the last uh, two years. Um, I, I don't have a picture for this, but I was watching this, and maybe you were too, when uh, Joe Wilson, is he of South Carolina, yells during a speech. It wasn't a State of the Union speech. It was a speech to, to lay out what went on about health care. And I think the point he was talking about was that uh, illegal immigrants would not be covered under, the, uh, under Obamacare. Say it again. Hi, Marianne. Uh, as in four years ago. Uh, Live TV, you know, I watched the president, uh, the speaker Pelosi and the vice president kind of their heads tilting like, what the hell? Um, it, it was really a new era. My son's American history teacher showed me then the picture of the, the guy who caned the other one almost to death in 1860 or something. But by and large, this isn't even part of my uh, uh, memory of, of recent time. Um, by the time, it was it March 2010, finally, when, the, when Obamacare gets to the, the floor of the Senate, uh, the floor of the House, where it needs every last vote, and they get those last six votes, Nancy Pelosi and, and members of her coalition, not real happy with the fact, but they had to get Bart Stupak out of Michigan and pro-life Democrats by having uh, these waivers allowed for the religious institutions. Nonetheless, we still had, uh, I forget the fellow's name from Texas, uh, who yelled at him, baby killer, from, from the audience. Not quite the same as yelling at the president, but it was part of the mood. And I think it's wrong in, in 2013, January 30th, to say, well, we know how things turned out. This was just an ugly period and went away. I mean, this is part of the endemic conflict. And I do think, I will go back to Spirag. I think it's qualitatively a moment that we share, and uh, it is different. How it goes in the future, I don't know, but I'll give you some sense when I get to the end. Um, I'm a collector of images during these last four years, and um, The Dark Knight, uh, the late Heath Ledger's image for, from that, but for anybody of our age in here, I always, I thought lynching was the first thing I saw when I saw this. And I won't devolve, there are lots of people who do wonderful work on racism and encoded racism in this period. Um, why would that do, let's see. And also, oh. the trick the publisher says is to make sure that this is in JP, what, are, what do we use, pixels, pixels enough? size, um, thousand, thousand words. Um, not so much he's just shining shoes, but he's shining the shoes. There was a moment when this was a story. Boy, if I followed that, not a good story, because she's from view. Um, so I, I set these up in, uh, in juxtaposition and get to the point um, 
not of using a campaign, an electoral campaign in a moment, because I'd be willing to use what will now follow as chapters three, four, and five, the next three parts of this talk to set up as why the ascendance of the Tea Party isn't America. In the same way that Senator Moore said, Karl Rove doesn't seem right. The projection of the center-right country and the Republican dominance. So, um, and you go, oh yeah, well we know how the election turned out, of course it's not. But the first is that my issues, and I think by, by the time I'm done writing this, it, my issues, um, I refuse to use this thing and I should do that. Uh, my issues are such that um, by the end of this, it won't have as much as what a criminologist would say, well, where are all the victimless crimes? Some clearly remain important too today. Um, but what we described in 2007 seems to remain to be the trend, which is that we have incredibly liberalized, normalized in, in some of our social problems discussions, some of the things that we considered sin or uh, uh, crimes, disease in the past. The second, which is of course connected with that, is that religion, and Marianne knows because we sat here four years ago in the same talk, religion is a thing that, that people thought were, was very monolithic, um, very linear, very predicted. And what was true in that time, was true when we wrote this book, true today, is that uh, there's, there's quite a range. There's a moderating influence. There's a growth of secularization, especially among the, the, the young people who are uh, nuns, N-O-N-E-S, we'll talk later about N-U-N-S, <laughs> nuns, secular, unaffiliated, and so forth, um, that speak directly to this issue of whether social conservatism has the vitality that it once did. Um, and a third one really, to me, was a California moment, which it, it came out of Prop 8, when Prop 8 succeeded in 2008, even as Barack Obama was elected. And it set this kind of idea into motion, what if there's increased diversity in this country, and we're talking uh, Latino growth, um, as well as African American involvement, but it skews in a um, conservative fashion, especially on these um, social uh, morality issues. And so that was an open question at that time. Um, so these three chapters, three, four, and five, kind of together begin to uh, attack this notion that the, that the Tea Party dominance is yet another version of increasing conservatism in America. I'm reading a story yesterday how uh, Wyoming, which actually has no laws against, uh, it's a rather remarkable state, it's uh, uh, certainly a conservative state, Dick Cheney state, not same-sex marriage, but I think looking at domestic partnerships, um, remarkable in, in a period of time. Um, for whatever reasons, and those in this room, geez, 96 is going back only 16, 17 years, but if we want to go back further, if we want to go back uh, to, to the epochs that John D'Amelio talks about and the way in which, here is something, actually my thought always is that if you are really religiously conservative 85-year-old, you would be startled by how much change has happened on some of these things in your lifetime. Uh, child of the 60s, I go like, as predicted, right? Mm -hmm. Young people go like, you know, what's next? Is, is, it, is there an app for this? Um, <laughs> rapi rapidity, rapidity <laughs> is the moment for them. Anyway, this was an important point because, uh, so here's where even Proposition 8 was uh, here, but in the last few years and, and for whatever reasons, um, it was preceded, of course, by reform over don't ask, don't tell, which itself was meant in 1993 by Bill Clinton to be half a loaf, an advancement over prior policies. Um, but when it came along and was proposed and then embraced, it, this was uh, really a striking moment. Um, Admiral Mike Mullen testifying at, at, at uh, at congressional hearings talking about devaluing gays and lesbians in that regard, inconsistent with us as an institution, prompted what I call one of Dombrink's rules, which is if the military decides it's time to change something, <laughs> chapter is done, book is closed. Very impressed with that. And they, and they did. 
got to love them, they did. Um, for a variety of reasons, we can't pretend that it's not demographic in part, but it's not demographic only. There's certainly large tolerances and different attitudes among younger age cohorts. Um, Russ Duthat, who writes for the, the New York Times, quoted now, I guess, three and a half years ago, talking about the future of gay marriage. Steve Schmidt, who Woody Harrelson plays in that HBO thing, the advisor to John McCain, says right after the 08 defeat, you can't keep running on this issue. Um, and, and now you see that now this is actually kind of a, a 2013 notion is inevitability. If any of these political consultants think that this is a winning way for their party or their candidates to attract support, um, they're going to be surprised, I think. Um, and we have for the we have for the first time. Th this is just up there. I didn't add this in, but that George Will is saying it's a generational effect. Um, but the fact that you had the first three states uh, in this calendar year after 32 failures, the first three states, Maryland, Washington, and Maine, vote at the ballot, not in legislation, not by courts, not by governor's signature, uh, for same-sex marriage in their states really is a, a turning point. It doesn't mean that Mississippi's gonna have it, and that'll come up later in terms of how we are red and blue states. Um, but it really is qualitatively different than four years ago, I would say. Um, the second of the three um, pushbacks, if you will, is about the religious right. It's about religion in general, but it's about the whole question of whether or not religion continues to be the pushing force, the animating force for uh, these type of uh, conservative issues in America. And I was teaching in 2007 when Jerry Falwell passed away, and I went home that night with my old technology, and I recorded on my VHS tapes. God love them, they still play. Um, and I recorded all these interviews on CNN, folks who liked them, folks who hated them, folks who, you know, neutral, giving all this. And I came back to my class, which was kind of on this topic, and we, we had a time of discussion and so forth. And it, it was a kind of a moment of passage um, from one generation to the next. He was not a, a young person, but... Um, the whole idea of whether one could once again build a political movement upon this animus w was to be questioned. Um, it itself a changing phenomenon. I mean, at that point, I think I referenced Rick Warren out here in Saddleback Church and others. Um, but nobody has done it better in recent years than Robert Putnam of Harvard and David Campbell of Notre Dame, their great book, American Grace, which uh, Carol Shores, Val, uh, my students loved. Thick, big book. And, and Robert Putnam writes high level stuff, but in, readable stuff, but a big, big book. And there was kind of a, almost kind of a prurient nature. Right? We're learning about religion, the things we don't talk about that much. But I love this chart from his charts to show that the rise in, uh, these aren't all from prior the identified evangelical youth, but the, the rise in those who had no preference, these are the N-O-N-E nuns um, from a period in the, uh, the heck? I don't know what this means. Um, a period in 1990 to the present. And at the same time, it's hard for, it's hard for evangelicals to hold on to their young people. It's hard for Catholics, it's hard for Methodists, it's hard for Hare Krishnas, it's hard for, you know, um, people in Al-Qaeda, I'm sure, to hold on to, the, how do you keep recruiting people? Um, but this is another way the demographic changes might speak. Um, and Marianne, now I'm sad, I took, I took off the, at the top. Who speaks for Catholics? And, and I said, since 1969, the question raised Humanae Vitae, the Pope's encyclical on birth control, rather quickly the data was showing that the Catholics in the pews go like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and when we get to look at Catholics, and Catholics are always an important point in this chapter and throughout, the modal group really in America in terms of, of voting and so forth. Um, but there came in, in 2012, and, and this, this could, we could have fun just take this section out for an hour. In 2012, uh, Cardinal Dolan of New York, the head of the U.S. Uh, Conference on Catholic Bishops, 
uh, standing firm, the Vatican position, against the Obamacare um, compromise, waiver plan, who, what is a religious institution and do they have to provide uh, paid for contraception? And so you'll see in a minute the, the young lady who goes to Georgetown Law School saying, um, yeah. So they said, well, you know, your parishes don't have to, and I think your, your dioceses don't have to, but your hospitals do. And so they're going, you're telling us what's religious? Hospitals aren't Catholic enough? Colleges aren't Catholic enough? Um, and these are um, the, the wonderful group of women from Network and elsewhere out uh, saying, no, our gospel, our social gospel is a different thing, and in fact is conversant with this. And in a pure naked political sense gave uh, President Obama and the Democrats some cover on this issue because they said there's a diversity of thought out here and uh, uh, this man doesn't, uh, as charming and, and witty as he is, doesn't speak for all Catholics. Uh, Val and Carol would tell you in, in a class this would set us down for about 15 minutes, but um, I merely want to show you the people at Pew who do such wonderful work. I want to show you this, for example, and, and these are my Catholics. This is not weighted by size. Catholics, I think, are 25% of the population. Um, and you say, oh, sure, John, but this president did worse than he did, worse than him. It's just that there's a lot more Latinos now, and they wait for that because that'll come back again. But as we go through groups, the, the Obama victory not as pronounced as it was in 2008, but he's not the secular antichrist president that people made him out to be. In fact, he uh, speaks from a prophetic tradition and himself is a, a person of faith uh, and so on. Um, this segues into what will, is chapter five, which it raises the question of, is there a displacement? Is there a growth in diversity, but on, on my issues? Is there a backtracking? Are we getting more people of color, but they're religious people of color? And I, I think of, uh, you know, gay men in Amsterdam, who for years have built up a, uh, a kind of great uh, criminal justice legal system and tolerance and so forth, and, and then find themselves berated now by young immigrant youth who come from a, an entirely different background. So in 2008, the first exit polls out of Los Angeles, which were rebuked later on, said 70% of African Americans brought back Proposition 8 to um, repeal the California State uh, Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage. Uh, Karen Bass, the Assembly Speaker at that time, people spoke out and said this was inflaming things. But later on, um, political scientist Timothy Egan uh, goes back a a and they did a more careful analysis, of course, on Nexapol, but they showed also that they hung it on the, the religiosity, some of which is very cohort specific, very age driven, um, with opposition. And that, that makes kind of, we nod at that. We tend to think that makes sense. And this is a really good system, but here's data from, from the 2012, and I don't have a date on that. It's not election data. But in this now, and now we, we switch only to Latinos. And this is uh, uh, Mr. Lugo, Reverend Lugo's uh, subgroup at, at Pew and elsewhere. To those of us who thought like, oh, church going Catholics and very socially conservative and very macho men and all this, you go like, that number just jumps out at you. And especially if you're thinking about a demographic replacement theory. Um, November 12th in Maryland, uh, not over 50% large number of African Americans supporting gay marriage, which won in that state. 52% of blacks and Latinos who turned out said they support gay marriage in their states. Wasn't up on a vote in, in, in most states. But that's a sizable difference. And in part, you know, the, the fact that the president himself spoke out kind of galvanized whether you thought he was coming late. And, and what he said at the 2013 inauguration was historic in talking about Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall. 
Um, I'm not a political scientist. Mark Petraka is a really good one. Um, my job is to not make this chapter bleed into the other chapters of the book. But, and, and today is not, this could be four talks, as you were saying before, Julie. Um, today it'll do its job in 10 minutes, right? And you go like, I could have done that. But um, notice my fairness attempt. Both flag, both of those. I tried to get the uh, slogans, right? The slogans of each, uh, believe in America, uh, forward. Um, you can laugh here. Um, I, you have to do duty to the, uh, uh, the primaries. It always says if whoever's got the primaries in trouble because their party will veer left or right and they will cement them into a position. In the case of Romney, it was immigration. It was, it was other things. But there was a moment, and, and you, uh, to check, you know, do Sudoku, yes. Try to remember all these names and come back in like four years and go, Rick, Rick Perry. Um, this can be a list of things, and, and I'm trying not to, uh, to, to take this on longer, although I, I will write longer about it. There's always issues about who is the focus du jour as they slice and dice the electorate up. So uh, the soccer moms with their uh, kind of suburban leaning, but uh, were of the 1990s, the waitress moms, the Walmart moms, a lot of gender embedded in this, but the NASCAR dads, uh, kind of a, a, a poor foray, uh, national security issues after 9-11 in terms of security moms. And really, I think in 2012, one of the things that people will be sorting out, digging out, is the notion of what I call the birth control moms. Um, really was an opportunity you'll see in, in a second that I think something got rewritten and, and pushed back in a way that may not come back. Um, again, for our, um, for our test, if we were in flight, the great moment when uh, Mitt Romney talks about makers and takers, the, the role of the economy, the size and role of government. Um, Six billion dollars did they spend on this campaign? A billion each on ads, whatever. Uh, um, certainly a, a, as those get written about and so forth, you know, trying to paint the Republicans as the heartless party of capitalism or the one percent to that person who said, your book should compare Occupy and Tea Party. And I dodge that. Um, who would have thunk that this election would have come after a Supreme Court ruling that said anybody could spend any amount of money in any way? Um, if this was a Republican uh, gathering like they had two weeks ago or something, they'd be going like, I thought we had this guy beat. How did this happen? Um, and, the, and there's reasons. Um, this is my favorite. Um, we, we joke about apps and we jock about the fact that people won't be looking down at their devices during this, which I do appreciate. You can't get that in a class, am I right? You can't get somebody not doing that. But I read somewhere that the Obama campaign had one person responsible, volunteer, not paid, one person responsible for every 50 people. And I don't know if this is in general or at a point. And I'm not sure if this is, I'm going to find this out before this has to get published, whether this was only in the battleground states. I was in Nevada, so it could be a battleground state phenomenon. But that the Romney people had one for every 1,000, a 20 to 1 ratio. And, and you go like, oh, that's how they did. And the social media really is a, uh, a generational difference. I mean, you're all very uh, smart. You're keeping up on these things. You're, you're all wired and facile. But these young people, uh, you know, can do it with their eyes closed, do it backwards, and so forth. And... Um, and then you add on to it, of course, the, the turnout events that happened. Um, we would be wrong if we didn't suggest that there were great moments, Clint Eastwood and his chair. Um, Bill, Bill Maher tweeted, Mommy, there's an old man beating up a young boy on television. And, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, so I want to get to one of my, um, my serious issues, and I'll keep about five to seven, yeah, to get there. Um, 
Reproductive rights. I, I show this every class I teach on this issue, and of course the, the American takeaway, this is from uh, a few years back, but it'll look the same, is that most of America falls in the middle of abortion should be legal in all cases or illegal in, I'm sorry, legal in most or illegal in most. And for the illegal in most, they don't want uh, teenagers getting out without consent, and they don't want late-term abortion and partial birth abortion, as they say. Legal in most cases, you know, up, uh, I'm sorry, up to that point. And so illegal in most, I flipped them. Illegal in most would say I'm against it, but rape and incest, I understand why. And so that line got kind of crossed in 12. Um, so when you talk about reproductive rights, it's not usually the strong pro, strong with very little in the middle. There's a lot in the middle. And social conservatives like Gary Bauer of uh, American Values were pointing to the fact in 2009, and they doubly point to the fact, Roe v. Wade had its 40th anniversary last week, they doubly point to the fact that the youngest cohort, not so enamored with abortion, didn't fight for it and so forth, and so they say, oh, change are coming for us. Ripe opportunities. Um, this is up into 13. This always says, yeah, but when you actually pull people, they're in favor of Roe v. Wade. So, so now the games begin, right? It's 2010, whenever it is. The state of Al Indiana does its ban on Planned Parenthood funds, um, causing pushback on, uh, on Planned Parenthood and reproductive rights issues. Um, the war on women becomes a meme in that time and, you know, is debated and, and taken back. But nowhere, Mr. Limbaugh again, um, nowhere is it probably uh, better personified than the, than the uh, when conservative radio uh, uh, personality, uh, Rush Limbaugh, calls um, Georgetown Law student Sandra Fluke a slut on his show because she's standing up and saying, um, in front of what, an all-male uh, subcommittee, saying that th this uh, Obamacare provision, this waiver, is important. She uh, goes to law school at a Catholic college. She should darn well be protected, uh, people of young age and so forth. And so this really began a period of kind of uh, um, torching the field in a lot of ways. In Texas, somehow I think, I, I think somebody's going to come get me for Doonesbury's uh, cartoon. In Texas, of course, they have the transvaginal ultrasound that you have to have before you have abortion. You have to see the baby's image, the heartbeat. You have to listen to it. You can't put your hands over your ears. But I think when awards are given out, um, this man, who we all know at some level in this room, congressman, member of the House Science Committee. Member of the House Science Committee. And, and then I stopped saying, oh, well, they probably thought through this climate change thing, and they really do think they have. You know, after this, I go like, I don't think they're thinking through stuff. Um, he lost, of course, the election. Uh, the female body has ways to shut it down. You think that would be the clarion call that others shouldn't enter this territory? Indiana candidate, treasurer, I believe, state treasurer, Richard Murdoch, doesn't say something that is 10th grade science incorrect, but he says something that is 10th grade religion dominant. Um, even if APAP is the cause, that life begins from God. God intended that to happen. A moment, really, um, as uh, I, I got to find out who this is. You, you are my uh, Patricia. Not for the 10th, but certainly I, I got to find out how to make sure I get a good piece of this. Yes, the female body had a way. Uh, Bill Galston, the very learned former domestic policy uh, advisor to Clinton, said uh, just in this last week, you know, the, the, the gender gap was 18 points. Um, it was not too long ago, and then I'll move on to the concluding error. It was not too long ago that conservatives, social conservatives, had found that this late-term abortion, even if it's 1% or one-tenth of 1%, was such an ab ab abhorrent idea, horrific image, that they were beginning to get um, a payback on their investment on making this issue. And especially to young people, they go like, oh, that's, that's infanticide, that's horrible. For some reason, they managed to go backwards in 2012 to an issue 
we were talking about in the 1960s that's been settled issue for a long time and so they have kind of reset the the playback machine for that time um, large Latino excitement large Latino turnout um, this was the prediction that this was not going to happen but in fact Bill Galston again youth turnout important across the country and, and in this in a lot of swing states uh, and so we have an electoral map, which we all saw in November. All of us, except for Karl Rove, <laughs> who at uh, 1026, uh, 826 California time was still not sure that they had done the math right on this and, and blew up on, uh, on Fox News. More about that later in the written version. So into the conclusion, then what? And this goes a couple directions. I leave for thought. I invite your questions and your learned comments. Um, geez, this always happens. Somebody's got to come out and go, well, our guy was too liberal. He wasn't one of us. He wasn't conservative enough. So red states, uh, Eric Erickson writes that. One of the Tea Party people writes that. No big deal. Um, David Von Drilly, who's a journalist for Time, um, in more of a mode of what will happen is if Romney's victory, and now it's kind of not happening. He's the forgotten man. He's pumping his own gas down on La Jolla. And I, I, think, I think I saw him on a street corner in those signs. Um, the quagmire of the culture wars, OK? Um, Stan Greenberg, who with James Carville, our Democratic strategist, not going to be impartial on this. Thomas Edsel, a wonderful journalist. Um, the Republican Party brand, and you read about this. Um, You'll see in a second that, that I'll say, you know, that may be much overstated. Uh, I don't think this is. This is reporting from the New York Times as they look at things. Sarah Posner, a, a liberal writer for Religion Dispatches. I think going back to my chapter four, and I will say again in a minute, that religion ain't going to be the way out for this. Social conservative ain't going to be the way out. Um, Frank Luntz, the voluble uh, pollster, uh, saying soon after the election, focus group participants, he has stopped focusing on abortion and social issues. Although Gary Bauer and, and uh, activists from that point of view saying, the more we lose, the more we need to fight and stand up. Um, wonderful thing, my sociologist colleagues, um, Eric um, Kleinenberg, um, now at what, NYU? Um, the large number of people living singly in the country is just phenomenal. I don't know if it's 40% or something. Um, and I read this in a way as having back to this issue of, of reproductive rights as, a, as kind of an organizing thing. You know, it's not Wally and the Beave in the suburbs as a notion. It's not the soccer moms. Um, nobody wanted to talk, well, no Republican wanted to talk about this guy, but he did talk about um, in O. Oh, five, he talked about the need for immigration reform. He said it right after this election. Boy, yesterday, in the last couple days, his party may be coming around to it. Will guns be an issue that we fight over? Um, I was saying to, uh, to Julie, you know, we're talking about Gabrielle Giffords, and uh, I thought the moment for me as I'm writing that this whole thing turned was that January day in Tucson where suddenly the kind of freight and the weight of the, some of the uh, animus came home uh, to take several people's lives. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to say much about guns other than to say 40 years ago, everybody here would be smoking and not asking the person next to them if you know, they, We went to that and we said, do you mind if I smoke? And then we said, no, you'll sit in that side of the room or you'll sit in another room. But there was a time when we just go like, what? You don't like? Okay, I won't blow it in your face. <laughs> so we'll see. I'm not going to go out on this. Uh, blue states, red states. Will we dissolve in the states that are purely red, in which the, the Defense of Marriage Acts are passed? Will conservative, which, if, you know, this I think is uh, Gallup, um, whatever their issues, always measure conservatism higher and higher rate. Um, Frank Rich, who, who uh, no matter how many times it looks like the conservatives have been down, they come back from the grave. It's like a bad Freddy uh, movie. We were always gobsmacked. Another word that uh, Spellcheck doesn't like. 
Paul Starr wonders if we are inevitably a 50-50 society. Um, Russ Dalton, who teaches here in political science, talks about the growing number of people who aren't party members. And especially when you think about this young cohort, it's not clear that pl this means, oh, Republicans lost, Democrats win. Eh, there's a lot of independents declined to states out there, much more dominant. Um, Ron Paul had his moment, he may not within that party have, but libertarianism, it's great Orange County topic, has to have some legs. I don't know, it could go nowhere, but both as a thought and as a manifestation. Um, I just threw this one in for me. Uh, Virgil, the president is not gonna come here, confiscate your guns, and force you to gay marry an illegal immigrant. <laughs> I should have put the word rapidity up here. So some people very challenged by change and the rapidity in which it happens. Um, last two slides. Um, I found this image, read nothing into the image. Um, the Reagan revolution, the Reagan presidency, the, the shift in, in, was famous for bringing together collectively, successfully, three parts of a, of a ruling coalition, economic conservatives, continue to this day have their, their uh, policies represented very well in the Republican Party. Foreign policy conservatives, uh, neocons as we grew to call, uh, call them, although maybe the differences have, have gotten lesser over time, and social conservatives. And social conservatives would be the foot soldiers to get people, you didn't see Henry Kissinger knocking on doors to get people out. Um, social conservatives did, they used their, their contacts. Um, so I, I will end with, uh, with this slide, I think, um, the Republican Party will win the presidency again, maybe as early as 19, 2016. Maybe not. Or I'm not saying that we're in a period like Karl Rove, and I don't think uh, David Axelrod said that, or Harry Reid said that. Um, think back to that slide from Gallup. Conservatism will continue to flourish. Will it be dominant? Will it, will it drive to discourse? I don't know. Will it be embittered? and? And uh, looking out the window, um, like uh, Virgil was, I don't know. And conservative Republicans within their own party may get rid of moderates and continue to have the, the dominate their party, as well as the nation's ideology. You know, it's very fluid time. It's very focused on the individuals and so forth. But I, I will go. I don't think it's out on the limb. Marianne, four years ago. Tony, four years ago. I will go out on a limb and say that not just because Jerry Falwell died, but I don't think ever again this part of the triangle will somehow be the jumping off point, the fulcrum point, the something. It just doesn't feel like America anymore, that social conservative will be that. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. People have to go, no embarrassment, make a run for it. Um, what's, your, what's your system? Do I call on people and do I, do I hand this to them? Okay. Who do you, are you calling on? their hand up, I'm walking towards you. Who do you see as possibility of running in 2016 for the Republicans, if they're gonna win? If I was, Mark Petrock would probably have an answer to that. Um, I would say one thing, which is, boy, defeat teaches you lessons. And that was a 50-48 or 51-47 election. And, you know, we always said John Kerry lost Ohio by 100,000 votes. And with that, he would have won in 2004. So I don't doubt that somebody is studying this right now. Why do we have immigration reform? Um, you know, so it, it'll be different. Um, whether that's enough for people to say, gee, you're a latecomer to this or not. You know, people don't like getting their eyes you know, poked in the eye. Hey, Latinos, go back to Mexico. You know, we're, people like to sense, you may not be at my table, but you know, we're all a family. I think things will change. And so the platform might, that, that's a real issue, is how do you reconcile these two issues, the need to reach and the fact that you have this core bedrock of people who are kind of embittered with that. I don't think that they have to be 
a little bit quieter. Otherwise, I'm going to sing. <laughs> oh. no, no. <laughs> Um, you put out statistics, you talked about some of the younger cohort, yes. you apparently teach uh, still with large classes. Do you get any sense in discussions in your classroom what your students' reactions are, particularly to issues surrounding um, reproductive rights, uh, one, and this other issue of you know the rise of conservatism? Do they talk about that? Do they agree? with these things, or where, what, what are you hearing at the ground level? Yeah. Thank you. Um, one of the things I try to do, I keep a seating chart. My class will go 90 to 100, I think. I keep a seating chart just so I can, if, if no one will volunteer, I go like, hey, just not your idea, but tell me what a position on this would be and get the ball rolling. I also have people write things down at the beginning of the quarter, like ideas about this. I have people, uh, you know, watch campaign ads, write down things and so forth. Not like, I'll get points if I agree with you points. Um, I will tell you one thing, not my topic, not on here, but don't try to get an anti-drug talk to this group. <laughs> that, that's one of my findings. When I'm taught drug class, I go like, I ain't talking about this. Um, reproductive rights, I don't know. I, I find the women students very intent when I'm talking about it, and the men students kind of <laughs> so, I, you know, that's a different focus group for uh, Chris and Luke or somebody to go through and find out, you know, are men holding up their half of the bargain. And, uh, you know, that gender gap might show you that even young women go like, it's on us, you know, and, and react as such. Because otherwise, why is that so gendered? They're, they're not as... Uh, kind of Meredith Lee gave me the advice when I came here. She said, these students have no sense of irony or ambiguity. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, I'm a sociologist. That's all I've done for 30 years. In gray areas. <laughs> they're not as black and white as they used to be. They're, they're smart. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Lee. One of the things that would seem to me would be um, important to Include in your in this discussion is the increasing uh, homogeneity of um, districts and communities yeah. that we live in an increasingly segregated way along religious lines, yes. demographic lines, so that even though you may see these at this national level, yeah. these shift these shifts in um, attitude around various issues you're talking about on culture wars. Within these communities, you may they may be very hardwired or increasingly hardwired. Common, not really. Yeah, one one of the things there was a point when there was an entire chapter about federalism, and federalism only goes part way towards that. But it's explaining is, you know, that's kind of like the third option: is America a, a series of red and blue states where they are really different? Hey, look, it's my husband Bob. Oh, well, don't come into our place. You know, if the red states get redder somehow and put up higher barriers, it's one of the reasons why immigration is such an interesting issue because it's got such a demographic component to it that, you know, here's McCain and Flake from Arizona. I mean, that's like a hot point for this stuff. Um, so I, I'm more optimistic on that. But I still get uh, part of this last chapter into are we going to be the, the non-United States of America on these issues. But John, related to that, I saw some data recently that showed, yeah. I saw some data recently, we think of immigration across national borders, of course we could think of it across um, U.S. states as well, migration patterns. I saw some data recently that showed that there were more um, people from the New England states moving to Texas than the reverse. And some of it's, of course, the economic pool. The problem is, I think, as Carol was saying, once they move there, uh, homophily is so powerful, they move to a locale where their worldviews reproduced. Because you kind of think it's a, a perfect way to scramble the eggs a bit. But the way we then locate and set up our lives works against scrambling the eggs. The, uh, thank you. you know, in some part, and I add on, international stuff maybe not as good, but I was down in Texas, my son's spending a, a, a six months there as an intern, he's in Austin, which is a great place. And Texas said they want to secede from the Union, Austin said if you secede, we're seceding from Texas. Um, 
But you know, the predictions that Texas with large Latino population will be blue in a few years. It, yeah, I was reading Robert Caro's last book, LBJ was Texan, Ralph Yarborough was Texan, um, Golf Briscoe. I mean, there, there's always been the Democratic Party, they're not doing very well lately. Um, Florida, screwed up state, yeah. electorally. Screwed up state, but blue uh, in this instance, the last two instances, right? I read that in Texas, they're down to 25% of people who have the Texas diphthong dialect. They mm -hmm. yell a little bit. So Houston probably has zero. You know, it's a big national city. But I was surprised because I thought, well, there's Texas. And I don't know if we want to use them. They are the state of Roe v. Wade. They are the state of uh, Lawrence, uh, the sodomy state in abortion. So we always find ourselves talking about Texas as a thing. Texas might change. AX might get scrapped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this may be uh, akin to your military statement, but it was kind of a shock to see the Boy Scouts changing their policy. Um, yeah, welcome to the new world. Everyone welcome, I think. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Um, yeah, it's one of these things. Uh, we write letters of recommendation for students, and half are on paper and half are online. They go, ten years ago, none were online. Ten years from now, none will be on paper. But we're in this period. How how am I supposed to do this? Where do I go? People will look in twenty years and go, "You did what?" Yeah. Um, so um, good for them. I'll get to say. Um, We'll have a separate session on Cardinal Mahoney and yeah. uh, inst institutions uh, stonewalling in a minute. Have you heard the term new evangelicals? A uh, yes. portion of them moving away from political association with the Republican Party. Absolutely. Um, and, and I will go back and make sure. So in, uh, in the 2007 book, able to kind of cram in at the end all the things that seemed to be developing. Richard Cizak at that time had started that. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's a mix, it seems to me, people stepping out, becoming unaffiliated, and people changing within church boundaries, becoming more like Catholics, I guess, more like Methodists. Um, I don't know how you parse the, the uh, election results. Because they look pretty similar this time, but it's a smaller end. Uh, but yeah, I thought absolutely a great thing. I, I'm, I'm uh, in favor of change and optimistic on all those interior topics. I think religion is probably the most misunderstood of them all, because people presume where you find religion, it's monolithic and it's conservative. And it's not. It's a great variety in this very observant country. I'm happy to end at any point you think I should. Well, I think probably that's good for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming and joining us again on the team.